Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Experts Online, um, part two, so to speak, or special session two. Um, in this session, we're going to focus on the fitting aspects, the clinical practice aspects with regards to uh, cochlear implants and music. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to just go through uh, just a key few points with you. Um, first, as a reminder, please name yourself. Uh, try to put your name, um, organization, where you're from. To avoid background noise, if you could please mute your microphone and also mute your smartphone or mobile. Um, for a stable internet connection, we recommend that you close all other programs on your device and all your comments and questions are welcome. And um, with that, let's get into things, so to speak. Um, my name is Jen Robinson. I'm a senior product manager and audiologist here at Medell, and I'll be the moderator for this session. And we've got Three distinguished guests today. I'm very excited about this session. Um, first, we have uh, Professor Benoit Goudet from the University Hospital of Reims, France. Uh, Dr. Melanie Gilbert from the University of California at San Francisco. And Alejandra Contitas, Senior Product Manager here at Medell. To start off our session, I'd like to hand things over to Professor Benoit Goudet, who is chief of the Department of Otolaryngology at the University Hospital in Rennes, France. And with that, Professor Goudet, I hand over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Jennifer. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. Um, I start my presentation. So thank you very much to give me the, the, the opportunity to present our studies about the, the cochlear implant fitting and the music perception. Uh, we know that the main goal of the cochlear implants is to improve the speech understanding in quiet and noise. And we know also that the sound provided by a cochlear implant is less natural, is metallic, and it's a poor quality for music perception. So the question is, is it possible to improve the cochlear implant fitting for a better music perception by modification of the frequency coding and without uh, uh, diminish, diminution of a speech understanding of a patient. So we, I'm sorry. Okay. So uh, for the frequency coding in the cochlear, the, the focus of our study was to to try to understand if in modifying the frequency coding, we could have a better music perception. So the frequency is coded by two ways, the natural tonotopy with the high frequency at the base and the low frequency at the apex. And there is also the phase locking, uh, which makes that the firing rates of the spiral ganglions represent the fine structure of the acoustic uh, signal. So uh, the question is, if we uh, provide uh, a fitting, um, a coating of the fine structure, do we have a chance to have a better music perception? It's the first question. The second is um, because of the natural tonotopy, we know that uh, if we, when we implant an electrode, the size of the cochlea is different between patients. The, the insertion can be also the depth insertion can be uh, can be also modified. So there is a shift, a possible shift between the natural tonotopy and the standard fitting of, of the patient. And the question is, if we adapt the natural tonotopy to the fitting of the patient, do we have a chance to have a better music perception without decreasing of the speech understanding? So for that, we did two different studies with different patients at two moments different. But with the same methodology, it was prospective randomized crossover double blind studies. It means that the patient was, uh, was randomized in two arms. Uh, the first arms had, had the first uh, step and uh, first fitting. 
And uh, in this case, we studied two things, two different things, the coding or not of the fine structure of the natural topy or the standard fitting. And uh, the first time at, at the first step, the first treatment, the first fitting, a test, and uh, in the second step, the second, uh, second fitting, and the second arm, the reverse. So we had the opportunity uh, to evaluate different the different fitting and to see if we had a better uh, uh, music perception and speech understanding. So to, to set the, the music perception, we use the multi-dimensional qualitative assessment, the Gabrielson scale. Uh, it's a two piece of music, uh, a, um, a suite of Bach and a, a, a symphony of Gustav Mahler. And the, those pieces of music were presented to the patient and the patient has to, uh, to, to evaluate on a visual scale uh, the, first, uh, the softness, the brightness, the clarity, the nearness, et cetera, et cetera, and the total impression to give uh, the, the music perception, to have an evaluation of the music perception. We did also test on the melodic contour identification. It's a software which provides a different kind of, uh, of music contour, rising, rising that flat, et cetera, et cetera. And the patient had to, 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 to recognize the good music control. The other uh, evaluation was an history questionnaire, which is a quality, which evaluates the quality of life in relation to the sound quality. Uh, we did also a melodic recognition test. We had the patient to choose two pieces of music they knew very well. So as you can see, it's uh, very, very famous uh, music, uh, classic music, Beethoven, Ravel, uh, French, uh, French uh, songs, um, jazz, rock and roll, et cetera, et cetera. We, we have the patient to choose two, uh, two pieces of music and to evaluate on the visual scale the quality of the recognition of the melody they had. The results for the first uh, study, so we evaluate uh, the, the presence or not the fitting with the fine structure or without the fine structure. Uh, we included 19 patients and 20 years. Uh, we didn't find any difference in tonal geometry and uh, we had a, a better uh, speech understanding in a quiet with the FS4 fitting compared to HDCES. FS4 is the fitting with the fine structure coding. Concerning the, the quality of the music perception, we had a significant effect of uh, fitting effect with the, the fine structure coding with a better clarity, softness, and nearness for the patient with the uh, FS4 fitting, with the fine structure fit, uh, coding than the, the other patients, the other uh, fitting. In terms of quality of life, life, we had a better quality of life with a positive correlation uh, with the Gabriel score for patient with FS4 fitting. So the the conclusion of this first uh, study, uh, the fine structure coding uh, allows to have a better uh, perception of the music with no degradation of tonal audiometry and speech understanding. Uh, there is an improvement quality uh, of music perception concerning the clarity, the softness, and the, uh, uh, the nearness. The second study uh, concerning the tonotopy of the patient. Uh, its study included 26 patients with no residual hearing and all the patients had a deep insertion with a deep angle perception over uh, 540 degrees. All patients had a CT scan after the surgery in order to, uh, to evaluate with the Medel Autoplan software the position of the electrode and with the Greenwood function, uh, it allowed to calculate the corresponding frequency bandwidth of all the electrodes. 
So it was the crossover uh, study. Uh, one arm at the tonotopy fitting, then the classical fitting, and the other arm, the classical fitting, then the tonotopy fitting. The results here are the, the differences in terms of frequency between the classical fitting uh, from uh, 300 to uh, 5000 Hertz. And here in red, uh, the, the, the tonotopy found with the CT scan and the Greenwood function. And in uh, black, you have the, the differences between the two fitting. So the differences uh, went from uh, uh, what was between uh, 19 to, uh, to 400 uh, uh, hertz. So uh, we had significant uh, different frequencies between the, these two fittings. In terms of uh, tonal, tonal geometry, we didn't have any differences in a uh, quiet uh, situation in terms of speech understanding. In, uh, noise uh, situation, the speech understanding in noise was significant uh, better uh, with the, the fitting, the tonotopic fitting. Uh, you, you have here the, the speech understanding with different uh, signal on noise ratio. And on all this, uh, this, uh, this situation, we had a significant better speech understanding in noise for the patient with the uh, tonotopic uh, fitting. In terms of Gabrielson, uh, we had also a better significant music perception, uh, mainly for the clarity, for the fullness, the nearness, the spaciousness, and the total impression. This is the music perception. Here you can see that the, the uh, Gabrielson, uh, Gabrielson score was significant, much higher for, sorry, for the patient with the, for the tonotopy, uh, tonotopic uh, fitting. And we had also a better melodic contour identification for this fitting, tonotopy fitting. And also here, uh, the, um, sorry, uh, for the, the music yeah, recognition. No slides, I just have it. So the conclusion is this fitting respecting the tonotopy. Uh, there is no degradation of speech understanding in a quiet situation. There is a clear benefit in noise. Uh, and uh, we can say that the correct tonotopy position of the pitch uh, allows to have a better speech understanding in noise, uh, mainly because the perception of harmonics, uh, which are masked by noise, are, are well represented. And there is a great effect on music perception, mainly on quality of sound, uh, melodic contour, and melody recognition. So in conclusion, adapted fitting allows to improve music perception without degradation of speech understanding. It, allows, uh, it, it, it shows that there is a, a great importance of the frequency coding in, for cochlear implantation. Um, for low frequency coding by fast locking improve the quality of sound. And respecting the natural tonotopy allows to have a significant effect on speech understanding in noise and improve the quality of music perception, melodic contour, and melody recognition. So those results encourage to propose to all patients a fitting adapted uh, to those to their anatomy and to consider the insertion depths and bears of the anatomy to propose a personal fitting. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Goodet. Um, I just have one quick question for you. Um, based on your findings of your study on tonotopicity, uh, what would you say to clinicians out there working with experienced users, because this study was in flesh, freshly implanted uh, users. So with experienced users, what would you say to clinicians with regards to music perception? Should they adjust to a more tonotopic map for experienced users? Yes, the, the question is, uh, do we have to, to uh, this research, as you said, is only uh, very fresh implanted. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the patient were, were evaluated at six weeks and less uh, six weeks. That the result was maintained over time. It's a good mm -hmm. question, I've not the response. But the first results, um, encourage to, to propose to all patients and we can 
we can wait that this result will continue to be better with a tetanotopic uh, uh, adapted uh, fitting than a classical fitting. So how, in how department we, we propose those kind of fitting for all patients right now. Okay, thank you so much. I know that um, you've taken a, a break, so to speak, from uh, surgeries, and we really appreciate you being here with us. It's my um, pleasure. Thank you very much. No, you need to get back to the surgeries. So again, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. And we'll uh, move on to our second speaker of the afternoon, uh, Dr. Melanie Gilbert. She's a research audiologist at the Sound and Music Perception Lab at the University of California in San Francisco in the US. And uh, Melanie, I'm the stage is yours, my friend. All right, um, and can you see the slides all right? Yep, all good. Wonderful. Well, thank you for the invitation to speak with you today about my favorite topic, which is music and cochlear implants. Um, I work at University of California, San Francisco in Charles Lim's lab, and uh, we're very appreciative for the support from MedL on our projects. Um, there's two main areas of research that we work on, cochlear implants and music perception, and also creativity and the brain doing fMRI tasks. Uh, and there's our website in, in case you'd like to look up our current projects. So I was asked to talk a little bit about the areas where people with cochlear implants uh, struggle with music perception. So specifically pitch perception, timbre, harmony, and auditory stream segregation, which uh, is the ability to hear different instruments at the same time or different voices at the same time. And one area that is very easy for people with cochlear implants is rhythm perception. Uh, so we do a really great job at that. And cochlear implants do a really great job, generally speaking, with speech perception in quiet. But music, because of these difficult areas, can really vary. Um, and it's, it's been shown that musical training can improve music perception. Um, but part of my job is to develop and collect normative data on music tasks to quantify how much somebody is improving with a given processing strategy change or with time, because there is a need in our field for better um, tests, better metrics of music performance and appreciation. So now I'll go over a few of the tests that our lab has developed um, in the past few years. So uh, the first, the most recent um, that we've been working on that I'm excited about is a pitch interval comparison task. This is a collaboration with Andrew Oxenham from University of Minnesota. And this graph that I'm showing you is a pitch map or a frequency allocation table for a cochlear implant. And the x-axis is just frequency or pitch and the y-axis is electrode number, channel number. And the gray boxes show which uh, frequency range each channel is responsible for. And then if you do a high resolution CT scan of the cochlear implant, you can measure where each electrode is sitting in an individual's cochlea. And that's what each of the black dots represents. And you can see that there's a mismatch there. And the red boxes show a remapping, a more accurate uh, pitch map. Some call it anatomy-based fitting or CT-based mapping. Uh, in order to better uh, approximate the anatomy and the insertion of that person's um, electrode array in their cochlea. Um, so the question is, does changing this to make it more anatomically accurate actually improve the pitch place mismatch across the frequency spectrum? How do we find out? Um, so we developed a task uh, where we have note, um, notes from a pure tones, but essentially like notes across the frequency spectrum in little intervals. And we try to see if the distance between two notes, maybe on the low end of the frequency spectrum is the same uh, perceptually as that distance in the middle of the frequency spectrum. So I have an example here. Um, there's a little bit of audio. 
you're going to hear an interval that is low and an interval that is mid. And now you'll hear what it might be if it's warped. Uh, so you may hear that in the second example, the upper interval is much smaller. Um, well, that's if you have normal hearing or an accurate uh, pitch place map, which is not a given. So we have been working on developing normative data for this task. We're comparing the low frequency range to the mid frequency range, and then also comparing the mid frequency range to the high frequency range. And we can quantify that warp. With this task, we can see oh, how many different notes is, is different for somebody between the mid and the high, for example. And then the hope is then if we change their pitch map, um, will we see an improvement or a corresponding change? That's the first task that we're working on currently. Um, a second task that we've worked on recently in our lab is timbre discrimination. So some people don't understand what timbre is. Like I did not understand when I joined the lab. And I learned that timbre is everything but pitch or loudness. So if you have two instruments, like a clarinet and a French horn, and they both play the same note, uh, in this case, G3, um, with a sustained um, envelope, they sound different and that can be attributed to timbre. Here, I'll play an example. So this, uh, you can see on the left the pictures of the instruments, and then on the right, you can see the frequency spectrum. Um, and these peaks are the harmonics. And the thing that makes the, these two sound different is the shape of these harmonics, where the peak and where the valleys are. Uh, because they're playing the same note at the same volume, but um, they sound different. And so some people have worked on timbre identification tasks, which is where you play an instrument and you have the person choose which instrument they heard, but you can train on that kind of task uh, quite easily as a CI user. You can hear a sound, know that that is supposed to correspond to a French horn, even though it may sound nothing like a French horn. So you can uh, we worked on it a little bit differently. We did a timbre discrimination task. And so that is, you'll hear three sounds, pick the one that's different. And this turns out to be quite easy for a CI user um, and a normal hearing person. This example um, is showing um, the some blends, however. So then we decided to make the task harder. Instead of asking somebody to compare just clarinet to just French horn, we made blends. So the zero dB, for example, is 50% clarinet, 50% French horn. And we would then have the task, if, they, if somebody does all right doing clarinet versus French horn, then we would do clarinet versus the zero dB blend. And then if they do all right with that, then we would go try the 10, to zero and then try the five to zero and see how small uh, we can make the blend um, difference for somebody to be able to tell. So it's a way of testing timbre um, that's not an identification task. And hopefully if someone has um, good spectral resolution, we might be able to see these spectral and temporal uh, uh, changes. The third task that um, we're working on right now, actually, I'm quite excited about is consonants and dissonance and harmonic consonants and dissonance. So you could describe harmonic consonants as a sound that is like pleasing to the ear or resolved or um, the opposite of this would be a dissonant sound. So it's a group of notes that when played together sounds awful, terrible, or if it's just a little bit dissonant, it might sound just a little bit off or unstable are words that people use to describe it. So here are four examples, A, B, C, D, of uh, what we call consonant tiers. So uh, tier A 
is perfectly consonant. It's a major triad in the um, in the bass clef. And you'll notice that the, uh, the treble clef, the melody, is the same in all four. So it's the same melody, but then four different versions of the accompanying chord. And then tier B has one dissonant note, tier C has two dissonant notes, and then tier D also has two dissonant notes, but more dissonant. So I'm gonna play an example. This is a, an abbreviated example of um, the same melody with four different accompaniments. This is A. This will be B. And this will be C. And this will be D. Uh, so for people with a uh, normal hearing, C and D can be quite cringy. Um, so we had a previous version of this study several years ago used by our lab that showed just tiers A through C. And for uh, our current effort, we created a tier D that is even worse because our cochlear implant patients often couldn't tell the difference between A, B, and C. The normal hearing folks could. Um, and so I wanted to create a condition where I was sure that the CI users would also be able to tell the difference. Uh, and the, the student that we had making D, the tier D, really didn't want to. It was a really odd, awful experience. And I said, just try to make it elbows on the piano. And that was what inspired this uh, fourth and worst, most dissonant tier. So this is some preliminary data, the first time um, we're showing it because we're actively gathering data right now. So along the x-axis is tiers going from A to D. And the blue represents normal hearing. And so you can see there's quite a bit of difference from tier A to tier D for normal hearing uh, control subjects. And then the red represents CI listeners. And you can see there's not so much difference between tier A and tier D, but it is statistically significant. Um, and this, the rating is pleasantness. How pleasant um, are these sounds to you? And uh, so this is a new task that we're working on that I think has quite a bit of promise for if we can improve somebody's uh, pitch map or other settings that they will, uh, with their CI, they'll be able to tell the difference between the different tiers better. They'll hear a more pleasantness, a, more, uh, a larger difference in pleasantness. Um, and I will note that this interesting in a uh, little reversal here between tier B and tier C. I just tested somebody yesterday who showed this same pattern. So it might turn out to be a thing, but we're early on in data collection for this task. Um, so pitch scaling is another task, the fourth task that um, I'll, I'll show you that we have worked on in our lab. So pitch scaling is um, ordering uh, these various pitches. So somebody's presented with six pure tones, the order is randomized, and then their task is to order them. And so then they take the bars and for each one they put them so that the top is the highest and the bottom is the lowest in pitch. And if they do it correctly, it should sound like this. And then we can use this to uh, find out what areas of the pitch range, the, uh, the frequency range they're hearing that they have difficulties with. So for example, this is one subject with their clinical pitch map and their CT-based uh, mapping. And you can see that there's a difference down here in the low frequencies. So we would say here is a problem area. Um, at least for the blues, they have almost no difference for the first five notes. Um, and then when you realign them based on their CT-based map, that improves um, in the, in the low frequency range. So that's one way that we're trying to get at uh, improvements uh, or just even changes with the CT-based map. So this CT-based map, um, I will cover our motivation for this briefly since it was already discussed today. 
Um, but we know that human, the human hearing ear can um, span the frequency range from 20 to 20,000 hertz. Um, but then each of the CI companies uh, presents the frequency range that is deemed most important for speech and music. And within a given uh, company, the default frequency allocation table is the same for every patient typically and for every electrode array choice, uh, regardless of insertion depth or position within the cochlea. And this one size fits all approach uh, does help people hear much better um, with the CI compared with without the CI. However, we think we can do better by personalizing it um, further. So this is a um, from a paper from Nikki Jim uh, from 2018 that we wrote, where the electrodes are um, shown here. And then the, I've made orange the most apical electrode, just to show the variability um, in insertion depth between electrodes of the same uh, depth in just four different cochlea in this group. And it turned out that with the 24 fully inserted uh, electrode arrays that we had in this cohort, there was about a two octave range difference for terminal insertion point. Um, and then there was about a one octave range difference for where the most um, high frequency or um, basal electrode ended up. So there's quite a bit of variability is what I'm trying to point out. Um, so we are hoping that we can restore accurate frequency information by using some personalized pitch placement uh, fittings. So here's how we're gonna try and do it. We get the CT scans, um, we measure the electrode locations within the cochlea, and then we use both speech and music um, metrics to evaluate their performance. And then we invent any music tasks or pitch tasks that do not currently in exist to try to get at this question. We're able to get quite high precision um, of the cochlear lo electrode location and the anatomy. Um, and then with quite low artifact. So this is a video that I created that shows um, scanning through the cochlea on one of these high resolution CT scans. So on the left two bars, you'll see, the left two um, panels, you'll see looking at a cochlea um, that has been like cut down the middle. And then on the top right is the spiral view or the da looking down view. And you can see as we drag up and down through the cochlea, um, you can see the electrodes appear and disappear. And there's a red line that is throughout, it's following the lateral wall of the cochlea. And if you unroll that red line on the bottom right panel um, from A to C, you see the cochlear duct length. And this is one way to measure total cochlear duct length and then location of each electrode and then calculate the characteristic frequency. Uh, so just my kind of final, um, my final question here is, does this high resolution imaging data um, give us enough information to improve place pitch mapping? Um, and can we show these improvements um, clinically? Um, and we receive so many um, musician CI recipients at UCSF due in part to, I think Charles Lim is a musician and um, patients want to, uh, they, they like the idea of having a surgeon who understands the importance of music. Um, so with that, uh, I'll say thank you for letting me share our work. Um, and we are currently recruiting <laughs> um, for a longitudinal study. So uh, if you know anybody who is in the San Francisco Bay area who is looking at getting a CI, um, and would like to participate in this CT-based mapping, please send them to me. Thanks, Melanie, really appreciate it. I'm gonna hold my questions uh, for you uh, for sake of time and uh, turn on turn it over, so to speak, to uh, Alejandra Cantides. She is Senior Product Manager and Audiologist here at Medell in Innsbruck. Um, and her, her work, Speaking for her, her work is focusing on the fitting of children. Um, so with that, Ale, please. Yes, so hello. So everything is, is good with my presentation yep. on my sound? You're great. 
Good. So um, I will move a little bit from the science and we will go more into clinical aspect. Very interesting, the previous uh, talks, I took some notes um, <laughs> and yeah, and I was thinking that I have, I, I'm meeting Melanie now for the first time. And it's funny because the examples I have here with children emulate in some way the experiments she did with adults. So we will see. So uh, music, uh, I think, is a very nice resource that we can use because uh, music moves to social interaction in a spontaneous way in adults and also in children. Uh, it regulates even our moods and it gives us better quality of life. So I think that it's very nice that we can give our CI recipients this, this joy. Um, music and language are universal. So there are a lot of tribes that they don't have language, but they have music. And uh, there is a very ex extensive population in the world that they have uh, music and language as, as uh, ways of communicating. And uh, both uh, the share, uh, some characteristics as sequences, because in, in, in both in music and language, you need sequences to create a message. Uh, they both aim for communication. And if we go more into technical aspects, we can see that rhythm, melodies, syntaxes, and uh, finally emotion uh, combined uh, for, for those um, two aspects. Um, if I will center myself only in two aspects, because if not, I will need much more time. But if we talk about rhythm, we can see that in music and also in language, we have beats, we have actions, and we have a tempo that uh, takes uh, the, the message through. And uh, regarding pitch, we have a frequency of vibration of the incoming sound, but also we have some temporal aspects that um, are, are uh, relevant in, in pitch and that can be seen, for example, in the FS4 strategy that takes care of this uh, temporal and place representation when we go into pitch. So uh, whatever is the, the starting point, uh, so music or language, they influence each other. And I think that the training of both of them um, influence and benefit the other ones. So it, it has been shown that, for example, the better the speech perception, the better the music perception, perception sorry, and also the other way around. So um, when we give uh, children um, aspects or, or, or cues regarding this, this uh, aspects that the children need uh, to develop proper language, which is the first aim. So uh, Dr. Godet mentioned at the beginning of his talk that the speech is like the first goal uh, for a CA patient, um, but also uh, music, as we said, can be very, very beneficial. And uh, within this hearing range uh, that we are showing here in this diagram at the left, we can see that all the frequencies and the intensities that are needed so to be uh, or to provide the child with enough cues that they can develop a proper language and if you see for example around 500 hertz we have discrimination that not only leads into the the possibility or to define or to realize which phonemes they are reaching to him but also uh, this is necessary to get a cues regarding duration or loudness, that this can be nice for music, but also it's very important to be able to define speech. So again, as I said, uh, the training of one can uh, benefit the other one very well. I will show you now uh, very fast, let me see, yes, I still have time, uh, some clips uh, that shows how we can train these aspects on children and this can help us also for fitting because when we train these uh, disabilities, then the fitting session with the child can be more productive. So let's see. There is some sound coming here. I hope you can hear it because it's quite soft. So these are sessions that were filmed at Six Süd. It's an institute in, in Germany for CI children. Um, here, the teacher is telling the child that uh, she will hear different uh, musical instruments and that she has to identify which instrument is this one. There are bells sounding. And the child is pointing to the correct instrument. Now there is a tambourine. So here we have uh, different pitches or different frequencies that are work. The, the intensity that she's using now is soft. So this is very good. 
Now the, this is a bell with another a pitch on another timber, as Melanie was showing before. Now we are going to see a little bit more complicated uh, task. Uh, Melanie also showed the same with adults. Uh, so this child has to differentiate between two sounds that are going to be played and he has to say if the sound is the same or it, if the sounds that he hears are different. Okay, Leo. The first two tones. So different. Is the same instrument, which makes the task a little bit more, more difficult, but this is the same as happened in speech when we have sounds that are similar, for example, sch. Now he's going to do another exercise where these sounds are associated to the animals that he has in the hands. So he has to distinguish between high pitch and low pitch sounds. So this is the high pitch, it's like the bird sound. Again, the same. Low frequency that represents the bear the same and the last one that is the most difficult one because it has to do with contours and the task in this case it will be that the child has to say if this sounds nice or if it sounds incorrect i know jennifer i have a little time i finish soon <laughs> Richtig, correct. Falsch, incorrect. Correct. Good, Leo. Auch falsch. So, I left it until the end because I, I want you to appreciate how uh, little differences can be realized with a child that has never had normal hearing. So regarding the temporal aspects of, of speech and the spectral aspects, they also help us uh, to, for speech in noise, which is very important for children because the majority of their time it is spent in noisy environments as the school. And regarding teaching, it helps us train in these aspects when we do single uh, channel stimulation, when we ask them to tell us if they are listening or, or not, the stimulation that we are sending when we are fitting, also uh, to compare, to learn to compare between two electrodes. And also we treat other non, um, um, or let's say cognitive aspects such as attention, memory, and so on. So if we have to think about fitting, I would say that we should take care of the same things for children, at least for small children, non-professional mus musicians yet, that we look at as when we do fitting for, for speech. So verify MCLs, look at thresholds if needed for soft sounds, especially AGC, map low, take care with compression because these can affect the speech and frequency allocation as Melanie was, was showing if it's necessary. So thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Alejandra. Um, and now I think we've got both uh, Melanie and Alejandra on. And, and if you have any questions, please uh, put it in the chat. Um, I have a, a few questions as I was taking notes as we went through. Um, Melanie, do you have just some general um, I don't know, tips and tricks, so to speak, with regards to fitting for music. Alejandra mm -hmm. focused on children's some tips and tricks. Do you mm -hmm. have the same that you've seen? Um, yeah, so I find that um, when I'm working with musicians, they often ask if they can bring their own instruments to mm -hmm. the session, and I say, bring them. And if they okay. have like a particular genre of music that they like to listen to and they're struggling with, I say like, bring a recording. And I am okay. happy in the 
um, during programming to hook up whatever audio file they want to optimize um, through whatever speaker or streaming modality they prefer or have them play their live instrument um, and they can play the same song multiple times while I um, change settings such as compression settings, which is I didn't talk about today, but we've worked quite a bit on um, compression of amplitude. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, so I would say it's, it's have people bring the target with them and so that you have um, the best chance of making a change live that they can hear at that time. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, there's a question that's come in, and this is to either one of you. Are there any studies of switching established CI users to anatomy-based frequency fitting that you know of? I mean, so um, so I ran one um, mm -hmm. recently um, yep. <clears throat> with established uh, users, and that's why this current study that we're doing, it was promising. So we are switching to using newly activated um, patients because um, we think that if somebody has had a, a, a maladaptive map for a number of years, um, their benefit may be limited from a, they may have already adapted mm -hmm. as much as they're going to adapt. Although I will say that I had a patient in that study, somebody who had been um, using their CI for both bilateral, both CIs for a number of years, who is a musician um, herself before uh, going deaf, and she just really, really struggled um, with hearing the same one pitch, but hearing it as two pitches between ears. Her ears mm -hmm. had never fused the two sounds. Mm -hmm. And I, I attribute it to her musical training because she can hear multiple instruments um, mm -hmm. and keep them separate in her mind. I cannot mm -hmm. do that. Um, so her auditory stream segregation is so good. She can preserve the difference between two ears. And so we with the anatomy based fitting, we got her two ears closer together. Um, yeah. And so, you know, we would play one pure tone and then she would listen with one CI, listen with the other CI. And we were able to try to get these, um, these two different pitch maps closer by basing them both off of her CT. Um, wasn't perfect, but it was uh, an improvement. Um, so I think there's promise in that, even for people who um, have been activated for uh, a longer period of time. Uh, to, to your point, Melanie, um, Anya Kurtz uh, recently presented um, similar findings. She looked at bilateral users in adjusting or using anatomy-based fitting um, for bilateral users and found with these experienced users that patients felt more balanced or in sync, so to speak, mm -hmm. between the two devices. Mm -hmm. um, I have a couple uh, more questions. Um, we're running out of time, but I'm hoping we can get through at least one or two of these. Um, one is, do audiologists and clinicians regularly ask recipients or their families about the recipient's experience, enjoyment, or interaction with music? Do you, do, have you, either of you found this with regards to regularly asking? recipients or, or parents? Uh, there are some questionnaires for, for children and family that they include some question about music in general. Mm -hmm. uh, so it depends uh, if you run the whole questionnaire, then sometimes there is some something, but it's, it's not a dedicated thing. Okay. Yeah. I, I would say that I talk to a lot of audiologists at conferences who'd say mm -hmm. that, um, you know, time is so limited um, mm -hmm. And it's difficult to, yeah. to be asking people and especially, well, and I think some audiologists, they don't want to open up a can of worms that they can't fix. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, if you have very limited yeah. time and it's very true and you worry what the answer is going to be, you're hesitant to bring it up. If you don't have mm -hmm. the fix, I would say that even if you can't fix it, um, mm -hmm you know, I would say it's still important to ask somebody because it really validates their experience. Even if, even if you tell them honestly, like I can, I can try, but I don't know that I can fix it today, but I am curious how your experience is with music, because maybe it is something that you, that you can, um, you know, that you can make a small change somewhere that might make a difference. Sure. 
Um, I've got one more question. Uh, this one, I think for you, Melanie, um, the, the comment and question is, I think it's great to have patients bring their own musical instruments and musical preference in. You perhaps can do this because of your research grant, but how do you feel or do you have thoughts about fitting this kind of focus into basic clinical practices? I will say I did it in the clinic too. Um, and maybe it didn't make me the most popular um, <laughs> audiologist based uh, with the comment about um, having thin walls with other consult rooms. Um, <laughs> but you could do that in the sound booth, um, which would you know attenuate the music. Um, also, you could do it with streaming. Um, mm -hmm. have people bring the um, musical or have people bring the music on their phone and then use whatever streaming modality they prefer. Um, that would cut down on that. Um, it's one idea. You bring up the inside. Well, I want to thank you both uh, for your expertise, um, your comments. Sorry, we couldn't get to all the questions, but we'll try to follow up afterwards. Um, thank you for a great session, and I'd like to have all of you continue to join us for our next Experts Online Music Rehabilitation Benefits for Pediatric and Adult CI Users. So stay right there, stay tuned, and we'll be right back. Mm -hmm.